Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. Things are getting a lot more advanced now. We have a new control ROM and 6 out of 16 instructions in our instruction set. Today, we're going to create a new component to make running a program way easier. Before we make a new component though, I want to start off by introducing a brand new instruction. One that doesn't require any new hardware or anything. It's called No Operation, or No Op, with opcode 0 and the mnemonic NOP. No Op literally does nothing. When the computer executes it, none of the memory should change whatsoever. So for the control bits, let's make the enable signal for the register file a zero. That way it doesn't get written to when the instruction is executed. And then it doesn't really matter what the rest of the control bits are, so I'll just write an X for them, meaning they can be one or zero. On the diagram, let's execute a no op. Specifically, this no op has all zeros for the operands. So in assembly, it would be written as no op R0 R0 R0. And to start off, let's say that this is the data in the register file. The opcode goes in here, which makes it output a zero for enable and whatever you want for the rest of them, let's just say zero. The operands go into their spots and when you press clock, nothing happens because you can't write to a register file when it's disabled. As another example, let's say the noop has operands R1, R2, and R3 instead. Opcode goes in here, operands go in here, and once again, executing it does nothing. In fact, nothing even comes out of the register file in the first place, because again, it's disabled. Therefore, it doesn't actually matter what these operand bits are. This is a no op, but so is this, and so is this. They're all functionally the same. So it's kind of silly to say that no op has three register operands. I mean, you can, but these operands are not relevant to the instruction. To be more accurate, let's gray out the entire operand section to signify that it doesn't matter what these bits are. And then in assembly, let's just write no op with no operands. Instead of writing it like this or this, we'll just write it as no op. That's it. The assembler will automatically assemble it to 0000, followed by, well, anything will work. In my assembler, I just made it follow by all zeros. All right, so in the last episode, we ended off by assembling and running a three line program by hand on the real computer. And this worked perfectly. We saw that the registers got updated just like we expected. But this method of putting in machine code manually is really tedious and prone to error. One wrong lever input means you're gonna execute the wrong instruction. So let's make a new component to store the program for us. I'll call this component the instruction memory. The instruction memory will hold a list of instructions each at their own unique address. It's a combinational component that takes an address as input and outputs the instruction at that address. For example, if these instructions are in the instruction memory, then putting in address 0 will output this, or putting in address 1 will output this. So naturally, when we fill the instruction memory with a program, let's make it start at address 0 and count up. Address 0 will store the first instruction, address 1 will store the next one, and so on. Now, the number of bits in the address directly determines how many instructions we can store. If we use a 3-bit address, then we can store up to 8 instructions, because there are 8 combinations of 3 bits, 000 to 111, or 0 to 7. In general, for an n-bit address, we can store up to 2 to the n instructions. So how big should our actual addresses be? This is a really interesting question, because it's a balance of pros and cons. A bigger address means you can fit bigger programs, and therefore do more complex things. But as the instruction memory gets bigger, it also gets slower and laggier. So for our computer, I'm gonna make it a 10-bit address, meaning we'll be able to store two to the 10 or 1,024 instructions. When I made this computer the first time, I found that 1,024 was a pretty good balance. It's enough instructions to run crazy things like Tetris, but it's not so big that it makes Minecraft crash. Okay, let's make the instruction memory in Minecraft. The first thing we need is a 10 to 1,024 decoder. That way we can put in an address and find the physical location of that instruction. So far in this series, I've always made decoders in one straight line, such as this 4 to 16 decoder. But this design creates some problems when you scale it up to 10 to 1024. The most obvious problem is that it becomes extremely long. So let's make it in a tree formation instead. When you put in the address here, it spreads out and propagates to all the branches of the decoder. This makes the overall footprint more rectangular, and it's also quite a bit faster. But another problem is that it becomes extremely laggy. When you put in the address, it visits thousands of repeaters and torches. So I'm actually using a fancy trick here to help with that. The bottom four bits of the address are used to find which branch it's on first, and then the rest of the bits are to find where on that branch. 
This makes it more efficient and less laggy because instead of searching all the addresses, it only searches on one branch. If that didn't make sense, don't worry, this is just an optimization. It's not super important. Functionally, this is still a normal 10 to 1024 decoder. When you put in the 10-bit address here, the corresponding torch turns on. Now let's build the storage for the instructions. To do this, I'll make a glass tower and a set of 16 blocks with nothing on them. Then you can put repeaters on these blocks wherever the ones are in the instruction. For example, if this is the instruction you want to store, then you can just put a repeater here, 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 and here. And as you can see, when the address is decoded, the instruction comes out. Let's build this setup for every address and or all the outputs together into one output line. And with that, we have a finished instruction memory. Let's put in some instructions and try it out. I'll just put in the example program from the last episode. Putting in address 0 gives this, address 1 gives this, and address 2 gives this. Also, notice that if I go beyond the program, like to address 3, it outputs all zeros, which is actually still an instruction. It's a no-op. This brings up an interesting point that I want to make sure is very clear. By default, when there are all zeros for every instruction in the memory, it's not that it's empty. It's actually completely full with all no-ops. And when you put in a program, what you're really doing is replacing some of those no-ops with the more interesting instructions of your program. In our case, we just replaced 0, 1, and 2 with these more interesting instructions. Okay, so we have an instruction memory, but it's still a pain to put in the machine code. If anything, we kind of made it worse. Now instead of turning on lamps, we have to fly into the instruction memory and carefully place repeaters. So I'm going to code a part 2 of the assembler, which takes the machine code file and converts it to a Minecraft schematic to paste into the instruction memory. As always, it's in the description if you want to check it out. I used a Python package called mcschematic, created by my friend Sloime. So now, if I run it with this assembly program, it'll assemble it to a machine code file, and then use that to generate a schematic. Then I can go over here, load the schematic, run slash slash paste, and it gets put in. In diagram form, this is what we have now. The instruction memory on the left, and the rest of the computer on the right. So let's go ahead and connect them. From here on out, I'll refer to the leftmost bit of an instruction as bit 15, and the rightmost as bit 0. So, bits 0 to 3 will go into the write address, bits 4 to 7 into read 2, 8 to 11 into read 1, and 12 to 15 go into the control ROM. This is just what we've been doing manually this entire time. By the way, to make the diagrams a little bit cleaner, I'm not going to include the control ROM from here on out, but it is still there and the opcode always goes into it. In Minecraft, let's make these same connections. Here I put 0 to 3 into write, 4 to 7 into read 2, 8 to 11 into read 1, and 12 to 15 into the control ROM. I should also mention that at this point, the real build will start to look a little bit different than the diagram. For example, in Minecraft, the input to the instruction memory is on the right, but on the diagram, it's on the left. And if you make your own computer, you'll probably find yourself doing this too. You'll diagram it one way, but then find out it's easier to build in some other orientation. Just keep in mind that the Minecraft computer and the diagram are equivalent. Throughout this series, they'll always have the exact same inputs, outputs, and connections. So, now that we're matching the diagram, let's run a program. I'll start by assembling this new program and pasting it in. It does two adds, a no-op, and a subtraction. And I'll just put these numbers in the register file to start off. First, I'll set the instruction address to 0 so that the first instruction comes out, and I'll press clock to execute it. Then I'll make the address 1, and press clock again, make the address 2, press clock, and make the address 3, and press clock. And just like that, the program was run. The first four registers went from 1100 to 3123. If you execute the program by hand, you'll see that that's exactly right. Okay, now we can run programs way more easily. Instead of flipping a bunch of levers every time, we can just paste in the program once, and press clock for every address. But there's still a pretty big problem. We can't put new values into the register file without doing it manually. So let's introduce a new instruction. Opcode 8 will be called load immediate with the mnemonic LDI. Load immediate has two operands, 4 bits for register A and 8 bits for an immediate value, which is just a number. When it's executed, it will put the immediate into register A. For example, LDI R14 assembles to this, and when it's executed, it will put 4 into register 1. To do this in hardware, we need to plug the bottom 8 bits, bits 0 through 7, into the data input of the register file, because that's where the immediate is on the instruction. But the ALU output is already going into that. 
So let's introduce a multiplexer, or a MUX, which will allow us to choose which input we want to allow through. I showed multiplexers in episode 6 of LRR. When the MUX control bit is 0, it will choose the bottom input, which is the output from the ALU. That's what we've been putting in so far. But when the control bit is 1, it will choose the new top input, which is the bottom 8 bits of the instruction. Since we have a new control bit, let's make a new column for it on the spreadsheet. Let's also do some color coding to make this spreadsheet easier to look at. There we go, much better. Also, notice that load immediate puts the value into register A. But on our diagram, register C is the right address, not A. So let's add another MUX to let us choose which register should be the destination. When the MUX is zero, the destination is register C, which has been the norm so far. But when it's one, it switches the destination to register A. I'll add this new control bit to the spreadsheet as well. And now we can finally fill in these control bits. Every instruction, except for load immediate, will put in zeros on these new muxes. Well, except for no op, which is technically an X because it doesn't matter. Load immediate will put in ones on these new muxes. Load immediate will also enable the register file, and it doesn't matter what the ALU does. It's not going to end up using it. So, on the diagram, let's execute a program with a load immediate, nice and slowly and in detail. This program has two instructions, and all it's going to do is load a register 1 with a 4, and then add 4 plus 4 into register 2. I'll start by putting in instruction address 0 for the first instruction. As this instruction comes out of the instruction memory, these are the bits we get. And remember, even though it's not on the diagram, the opcode 1000 goes into the control ROM. It's a load immediate, so it puts a 1 into these two muxes, enables the register file, and puts in whatever for the ALU. That doesn't matter. Since these two muxes both receive a 1, they both choose the top input. This mux chose 1 for the destination, and this mux chose 4 for the data. So when we press clock, the register file puts a 4 into register 1, and we successfully performed LDI R1 4. Now let's go to the second instruction by putting in instruction address 1. As this instruction comes out, these are the bits we get. And again, not seen on the diagram, the opcode for add goes into the control ROM, which puts in zeros for the muxes, one for enable, and zeros on the ALU to make it add. Since these two muxes both receive a 0, they both choose the bottom input, 2 for the destination, and 8 for the data, because that's what's coming out of the ALU. And when we press clock, the register file puts an 8 into register 2. We successfully performed add R1 R1 R2. And that concludes the program. Alright, let's catch up to the diagram and build these two new muxes in Minecraft. Here's the mux for the data input. I just made a tower of comparators on each input. If the control bit is 0, it only allows this tower, and if it's 1, it only allows this tower. And then here's the mux for the destination register. It's the exact same thing. Two comparator towers, with one of them cancelled at all times. Also, I hooked up the muxes to the control ROM, and updated it to match the spreadsheet. And now, we can run any program with these 8 instructions on the real Minecraft computer. To keep it simple, let's just run the two-line program from earlier. As always, I'll start by assembling it and pasting it in, then I'll set the address to 0 and press clock, set the address to 1 and press clock, and register 2 gets an 8. Perfect. It's worth mentioning that keeping all the instructions in their own memory bank like this is not the only way to make a computer. It's a design choice I made to make things easier in Minecraft, and this choice classifies our computer as a Harvard architecture, where instructions are separate from regular data. But there are many other architectures used in computers, and in general, there is so much more to computer science than just this series. So if you want to learn about all things computer science, I recommend Brilliant, who sponsored this video. Brilliant is where people learn all the nerdy topics like computer science, math, and engineering. Their lessons are unique in the way that they teach. They always involve hands-on activities, which builds intuition from the ground up. So you won't just feel like you answered questions correctly. You'll feel like you actually did something and became a better thinker. On top of that, the lessons are available 24-7, so it's really easy to fit into your schedule. Even with just minutes a day, Brilliant can become an awesome learning habit. They also have a mobile app that lets you do any lesson from your phone, so you can level up wherever you go. When it comes to CS, one of my favorite courses is the Thinking in Code course. It really gets you to visualize programming in a way that I haven't seen other platforms do. 
To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash mapbatwings or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription.